This episode is brought to you by Indie Film Hustle TV, the world's first streaming service dedicated to filmmakers, screenwriters, and content creators. Learn more at IndieFilmHustle.tv. I'd like to welcome to the show James Lafferty and Stephen Coletti. How are you guys doing? Fantastic. Thanks for having doing us. well, man. Thanks yeah. for having us. Oh, thank you for, for being on the show, man. I heard um, we, have, we have some friends in common, Ian and Esh Nelms, uh, who were on my show a while ago promoting or we're talking about their whole career but at the time promoting fat man which is obviously one of the best christmas movies ever made um <laughs> but uh and, and my audience was going crazy for that episode because it is just just hilarious if anyone listening has not listened to go find that episode on the back catalog because um the boys were great and then they reached out to me they're like hey i got these guys who did this insane thing, were part of this project, and they, sh- they pitched it to me, and I was like, well, I've never heard of that before. How the hell did these guys shoot an independent series that got picked up by a major streamer? Like, I know they picked up indie films, because my film was picked up, my first film was picked up by them for, you know, license for a year, um, back when they were doing that kind of stuff, but a show is unheard of. So um, we're gonna get into the weeds about how you guys did that because I'm fascinated. I truly, really want to know how the hell that happened. Um, But before we get into it, uh, how did each of you get into the business? We'll start with you, Jimmy. Yeah, so um, I started really young. Um, I started uh, doing extra work, actually, when I was about six years old. My uh, my mom would bring my brother and I in from Riverside County to LA just to get onto sets, um, just to sort of expand our world a little bit. Um, We didn't really know, you know, at a young age what we wanted to be um you know obviously we didn't you know we weren't like theater kids or stage kids or anything like that um it was really just for our mom to you know uh help us understand that the world was bigger than a small town that we came from and um we just fell in love with it of course i mean you can't really take a kid to a a film set and play around with other kids and get to experience that atmosphere and have them not catch the bug Hmm. and sure enough we did um and so from uh from about 10 years old on i started auditioning and um from there, it was just like a steady progression of, you know, booking my first Mervyn's commercial at uh, 12 to, uh, you know, getting a guest spot on, um, uh, you know, picket fences or something like that. And then, um, uh, you know, just continuing on from there um, to reoccurring roles. And um, I basically, uh, yeah, I, by the time I was a senior in high school, I had um, booked um, this little uh, uh, WB teen drama called One Tree Hill. Um, which ended up becoming um, sort sort of a hit, I guess. Um, it at least ran for a very long time um, until about uh, 2011, um, and uh, yeah, that sort of takes that takes us up to, to you know, I guess when I was an adult, right? You know, that's, that's <laughs> sort of how that was my way in, really. Right. How about you, Stephen? Yeah, I was a little more unconventional. I I, um, I kind of first started working the business in about 2004, uh, working with MTV. Uh, I started out doing a reality show with them, completely victim of circumstance. Out of nowhere did this uh, show land in my community and, and drop in my lap. Um, but I was interested in in, um, in hosting and wanted to get inter- in entertainment. And so, in fact, one thing I want to do was was to be a VJ, um, you know, watching Carson Daly growing up and um, doing that gig. I thought that was a pretty cool thing and, and wanted to pursue that. So I looked at MTV as like, well, all right. Uh, I feel like these people can get me in over there. <laughs> so mm-hmm. um, wound up doing this show called Laguna Beach uh, for a season, two seasons. Um, and then uh, I started hosting for MTV. Um, and then um, I did a little bit of acting growing up, it, you know, just just in school and stuff and enjoyed it. Um, but I uh, didn't think it was going to be something I'd take seriously. And, and the more I kind of got into hosting, I wasn't so excited about it found acting interesting, wanted to study it and, and did. And so as I was um, hosting for MTV, I you know was um, working on, on acting and, and studying. And, and from there, um, I booked um, my first film, something called it was actually it wind up being Havoc 2. It wasn't that it wasn't it wasn't supposed <laughs> to be the sequel originally. Um, but that's what uh, who to a new line. I think it was. That's why they wound up selling it as um, called Normal Adolescent Behavior. And uh, in that film, I uh, actually worked with a girl um, named Hillary Burton who worked on One Tree Hill. And um, I went about auditioning for One Tree Hill and getting a part there. And then um, it was kind of set on, on working in the show with James for about f- 
five or six years. So you guys, so you guys are coming at this whole thing very unconventionally because you're coming from the acting side. So you guys were on a on a hit show for for a good amount of time. Um, you've been on, obviously you guys have been on sets a lot throughout your careers uh, up to this point. And then what what made you guys get together and say you know we're going to take the power in our own hands and build our own content and try to sell that own content. So you essentially stop asking permission to do what you love to do and start creating those opportunities for yourselves. Very very Ben and, and Matt uh, Goodwill Hunting style um, in that way. So what what made you as actors decide to like you know is there something that caused you to do it or is there something that you tickled your fancy or did you like you know what we we really need to kind of get our own stuff going. Yeah, I think it was a mixture of things, um, as it always is, I guess, you know, it's it's it has a little something to do with, um, you know, coming off of a um, uh, a TV show and thinking things are going to be easy and it actually not being that easy. It's, you know, getting to a certain point in, in your life as an actor or I guess as a professional in this business where you realize that things are cyclical, like you're going to have you're going to have times that are, you know, really good for a while. You're going to have a great cycle and then you're going to have a really dry cycle and then you're going to, it's going to come back. It's a sort of pendulum swing situation. And you start to realize that at a, I guess around for us, it was around that 25, 26, 27 age when one tree hill was ending. Right. Um, but then also, you know, I don't think you can be on a show for that long um, and not learn something. I mean, you'd really have to not be, <laughs> uh, you have to be pretty yeah, dense. You have to be pretty dense not, at that yeah, point. <laughs> sink in. And I think, um, you know, we we were always paying very close attention because we always knew that behind the camera was where we would want to be eventually. We just we knew that we would want to tell stories. Um, you know, for me, a big part of it was being able to step behind the camera and direct on One Tree Hill. Um, and then I know, you know, Stephen can speak to, you know, the fact that he was producing coming out of One Tree Hill and stuff. But, um, you know, that's that's sort of where I was coming from is like, I know I want to tell stories, um, but you know, and I know I have, I'm going to want to write, right. So I'm writing scripts and these scripts are like high concept and very expensive. Um, and this is obviously, as you know, and your audience will know, these, these ideas are very hard to get made. <laughs> um, so at a certain point for me, it was like, okay, what can I make, um, that can, uh, be made, <laughs> you know, what can, what can we make that, that, that can be made for a reasonable budget and that we can actually shoot so that we can prove to people that we can tell stories and hopefully, take that next step as storytellers, not just people who are, you know, auditioning for jobs. How about you, Steven? Um, well, I think, I, I, it's, I feel like it was always somewhere, um, yeah, it was something in the back of my mind, knowing that, you know, in, in this industry, especially just with the technology these days, what it affords you, um, you better be able to figure out stuff on your own because, um, you know, I, I just I know that where I stand in this industry and I was not, you know, God's gift to the entertainment industry as an actor. Um, and so I knew to do certain things that I wanted to do. You know, you're going to have to create those opportunities for yourself. And um, so, I, I, you know, it, it's just kind of been a steady um, evolution of, of, you know, trying different things, you know, realizing I had all my eggs in the, in the acting basket when I was in my 20s um, and realizing that the opportunities that were coming to me, um, were, were kind of out of my control. You know, you go audition for things and some things you really, really want. And it's almost like the more you want something, the more you want up not getting it. And then a job that you're like, eh, I really don't care if I get this job. And it's like, hey, you booked it, you know, <laughs> you gotta, you're not gotta go take it cause I need a job. So I, I think that, um, you know, to, to really, as I got a little bit older, um, and a little more, yeah, a, a little more edgy about the business and realize, all right, um, if, if you know, what I want to do, I'm going to have to, you know, take the bull by the horns and try to figure out how to do it on my own because, you know, um, it's not going to all just line up with landing the perfect audition at the best time and, and booking it and then off you go. You know, it's just not, <laughs> that does not happen every day or, you know, uh, likely at all. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, yeah, I think from there, you know, it's, it's, it's been an evolution of certain projects that, you know, haven't gone very far and, and just, you know, whether it be a little bit of writing, a little bit of producing, but, you know, kind of learning something uh, from each thing. And then, um, you know, with this one, with everyone who's doing great, kind of felt like all the pieces started to, you know, fall into place where, okay, you could take, you know, what I've learned um, up to this point and, and trying to get stuff made and, and go out there. Um, also to say, you know, partner up with somebody, to, you know, realize that I can't do stuff, you know, on my own. And, and you, you know, you got to get good people around you to help you, um, you know, you know, fill in your weaknesses and, and, uh, mm -hmm and get, you know, get things made. So how did you guys come up with everyone is doing great? 
Yeah, it was um, it was uh, sort of out of necessity, I guess. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. You know, I think we had we had lived enough life coming out of One Tree Hill to realize um, that we had lived a pretty absurd life in our twenties, um, and to have that amount <laughs> of success um, at such a young age is completely it's absurd. It's mm-hmm. it's insane what 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 happened, and we were insanely fortunate. Um, and then to have you know some some years that weren't so successful, you know, to really humble you and to make you look back and go. Okay, I see a sort of like arc forming here where, you know, we had a late coming of age, you know, and and we had a late coming of age in this really crazy industry where the hilarious things are happening all around us. And there's, um, you know, extraordinary, extraordinary things happening all around us that really make for great comedy, Um, you know, and, you know, we've never we've never felt sorry for ourselves throughout this whole process of, you know, um, auditioning and rejection and all this stuff like. I think, you know, we've always found the narrative that it's, you know, a really tough thing to do a little bit tiresome because it's what we chose to do. Right. Like nobody's going to feel sorry for you because you just keep coming back for more and you know, you're always going to come back for more. So really for <laughs> us, the the catharsis in all this was just to laugh at it, to get together and to share our stories and to be like, you're never going to believe what happened at this audition today. Like you're never going to believe what I saw at this party or this person that I met or, um, and, uh, and, and just laugh at these things. And, you know, this is something that we really wanted to bring to a show that, that lined up with our comedic sensibilities, right? Like we knew that we wanted to make a show um, that was up to the standards of the shows that we love to watch. Mm-hmm. Uh, we love shows like Fleabag, you know, Catastrophe. We love this, The Trip with Steve Coogan and Rob Brydon. Like um, we love uh, we'll let the show on HBO, Doll and M, things that are feel really naturalistic and feel really dry and, um, mind the humor a lot of out of a lot of like awkward and cringy moments um mm-hmm. instead of punchlines um and we 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 just felt like we were like living in this world where all of a sudden we could see we could see this happening around us we were sort of observing it and um so we decided to sort of i guess take that and um and try to create some characters that we could map onto these things um and onto this world and into these situations um, and create a story around it that would also line up with our storytelling sensibilities, which is really we gravitate to stories about, you know, friends, families and, you know, families basically that are full of people that are just there. They probably shouldn't be friends, but mm-hmm. they have this shared experience or they have this shared past where they're sort of forced to continue to deal with each other. Mm-hmm. Um, and whether or not they stick together is based on whether or not they love each other. Right. Like right, those right. are the stories that we're on to. So. It was just all these things, a sort of confluence of things that came together to at this time to make us realize that we might have, you know, a story to tell here through everyone's doing great. Now, Stephen, did um, did your agents and managers and your friends around you say you guys are absolutely nuts? This is not going to work. No one's ever, you know, done an independent show before and sold it <laughs> anything major before. I mean, did that happen? <laughs> you know, I got kind of the... Um status quo from the the reps where it was like oh that's that's really nice oh that's sweet you know they're like okay and, and oh, you go I do mean, your little you're bit. still gonna be auditioning right like, <laughs> we should still be sending you stuff and i'm like yeah yeah no of course but please, please do um they're like okay all right just making sure but you know i think that they, they hear that and, and the expectation um on their end is like oh man if i had a nickel for every time i heard a client talk about something that they're making on their own and <laughs> never right. seeing the light of day uh, I, and even myself, they'd probably have a few nickels for me because I definitely have done it before right. um, as, you know, try to shake them down to help you, you know, get some traction on a script or like get something, you know, get them to read something that you wrote. Um, so there, you know, there was that kind of like, you know, yeah, they're just playing along. Um, but Can I, I think at, at Friends, it was, um, you know, there was we had some good support from friends that were rooting us on. Like, you know, I think people in the industry were like, fuck, yeah, man, like go do it, you know? And I think that it also, you know, with the community of, of people that got around our show when we were crowdfunding, I mean, that really helped lift us up and, and continue, um, have us continue to move forward on it was that, you know, people were on board and excited. They heard about the concept. They would just be looking at a log line and, and being like, you know what, that seems interesting. I, I'd be into that. And they're like, yeah, like I want to contribute to the show. Um, go on and do it. So I, I think it was, you know, for the most part, it, uh, it was positive feedback and, and to have like our, our communities of, of family and friends um, saying, you know, go for it um, is is really cool and, and, and definitely helped propel us to the finish line. So I, I find it fascinating when you said that the agents played along because I actually, you know, earlier in my career, I, was, I had a full 
films and I got a star attached and it was, it was a t you know, she'd done TV and she had done a few movies and things like that. And we go in and what you're saying is exactly what the agents would do. They came in, they did the show, they sat around the, 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 the conference table and like, okay, so, you know, oh yeah, we can go out to this person and yeah, we might know this person to try to kind of play along. And I was so green. I'm like, oh my God, we're going to get this movie made. This is amazing. And then, you know, nothing ever panned out, but they needed to play along to keep the client happy. So I'm so like, I didn't know that was a thing. And when you just said it, I'm like, that makes all the sense in the world because I've been in that room when <laughs> we're like, oh yeah, because she's the producer on this and she wants to put this all together. I was like, no no wonder nothing ever came of it you know Unless, of course you know I, it's like they don't they know the, the road and it's you tough know, it's I, tough i get it if they don't have the time for that and they're like look this is a bottom line game i'm here with my clients for and like you know like i know if this person's getting started on a project like this film is not going to be made next month in six months and wow if they make it in a year that's incredible so they're like i don't I don't have time for something that's two years out. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we need to get, we need to get paid now. now. I need my 10%. I, I, I need my 10%. I need my 10%. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm staring at 10% in 2024. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Good luck, buddy. Good, good luck. Yeah, good, <laughs> exactly. Good luck to you, my friend, but you're still going to go out. We can still send you out, right? We can say now we can still send you out. Yeah. I love that. Cause they're like, <laughs> we, we still need to make our money off of you right now. So it's, it's fascinating be supportive 100 percent. oh yeah yeah that's being supportive just just means like you know saying like yeah sure we'll help i'll but call like, i'll call i'll call will smith yourself, I'll call... and then we'll step in later <laughs> yeah we if you bring in five million we can get the rest <laughs> we we are game <laughs> yeah of course yeah you bring five million exactly. and will smith to the table we can get you <laughs> the rest of it no problem no problem yeah. yeah that's that's the way the game is played um so all right so guys how did you um but this, is this self-financed? I mean, because it doesn't look like it's like a, you know, it's not Game of Thrones for for sure. So I'm assuming the budget was, you know, indie. But how did you guys raise the budget? Yeah, well, it was, um, it was, I guess it was a, a, a sort of a tiered process, sort of just like the entire process was, um, you know, we, we didn't know that we were going to shoot our entire season independently. Uh, we started off with um, a pilot uh, right. and the pilot was self-financed. And very naively, we thought that we would um, execute this pilot and um, the money, it would be the money, and the then money we'd take would it just out come and in. We would sell it and then somebody <laughs> would be like, oh, yeah, we want this to be a, you know, Hulu original or whatever. Uh, yeah, that didn't happen. Uh, that didn't happen for a lot of reasons. Uh, you know, first of all, I think um, the pilot that we made was the pilot that we wanted to make. And we were really, really proud of it. But it was 2017. And yeah. Uh, um, you know, a lot of the streamers that exist now didn't even exist back then. And a lot of the, you know, bigger ones now were just sort of booting up um, and, you know, their different departments and sort of really defining what kind of th things they wanted to do. Um, and we just didn't anticipate the challenges of, of shopping around an independent TV show. Uh, we didn't realize just how kind of, I guess, unprecedented it was. It Insane. was just not something that happened. There was no yeah. template for selling it. Right. right. Um, further than that, we didn't know. Uh, that we even needed a sales agent, really. We didn't know the sales agent game, right? We were having our talent reps reach out to development people at these companies um, and seeing if, like, you know, they would get, you know, if, if they could push the ball forward. Um, we weren't even, we weren't considering the acquisitions departments and things like that. Um, you know, we'll talk about this later about, you know, we, we didn't actually know how, how sort of nebulous that world was as well and how many gatekeepers that there were and how relationship based it is. So we just didn't have any of these relationships or any of these connections. So um, once we realized we weren't going to sell the pilot um, and that if we were going to produce the rest of the season, episodes two through eight, through eight we were going to have to do it independently. Um, we were uh, we, we had always considered the crowdfunding route. But um, we didn't know for sure if we wanted to take that plunge. It was our last – it was really our last sort of final option because we had heard that it's going to be the hardest thing you ever do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've done it. It's so horrible. We like, yeah, and you know the Nelms brothers um, who you had on in the past, like they they did it as well. And I watched them do it. And I watched them break their backs for, for the money that they made for Post on, on their first movie or one of their first movies. And um, – you know, they were they were encouraging us to do this as well. Like the Gnomes Brothers had our backs on the crowdfunding front. They were like, you should do this because it's going to help you retain creative control. Whatever money you can raise of, of your budget, it's going to help you uh, maintain that leverage um, and, and that control over the project for, for its life. Um, 
And so, uh, yeah, I guess, you know, once we had exhausted all options, we, we took that plunge, that crowdfunding plunge. Um, crowdfunded for how many days, Stephen? 45 days? Mm, um, yeah, at least 45. No, Ju- all Ju- June, July, and then we extended a little bit into August. So it, it wound up being up to about three months. And what platform did you guys use? Kickstarter, Indiegogo? Indiegogo. Great. And how much did you guys raise? We wound up raising about uh, 270K. And that's, then, um, after, that's awesome. yeah, after fees and, um, uh, we had to take some money for, of course, for the perks and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. We were able to, to use about at least 200, uh, 210, 215 into our budget. Um, and then we had to bridge the gap a little bit to get to where we could, you know, still have enough to finish the season. That's amazing. But that's a, that's a success, man. Like you pull in over a quarter million on a, on a platform for a, a television se- or a streaming series. That's a pretty a pretty good goal i guess you tapped into a lot of your fans and and things like that to 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 help with that i'm assuming yeah no i know and for for sure yeah to have people you know um contribute for a a, you know a show they haven't seen before you know this was not the uh reunion uh or the sequel (laughs) of something so you know people were having to take a leap of faith for us um and you know i think that was that you know, we struggled a little bit out the gate um, trying to get people on, on board for this. But it was, you know, ultimately it, it was that community behind, um, you know, One Tree Hill uh, that, you know, um, got got involved and, and, and wanted to see us, you know, where we wanted to support us in whatever our next uh, venture was because they knew that maybe, you know, the reunion wasn't going to be happening anytime soon. So, um, yeah, incredible community of fans there been very loyal and, and we're very grateful for that because without them this doesn't happen and it ultimately was you know about two weeks in we're like we need some sort of kick you know we really need something to, to boost um the finances there or at least you know the money coming in for um for the indiegogo project and, and we we came up with the idea of, of doing some live watches where we would uh invite some cast members from the show from uh, our old show once hill and and watch an episode and um you know, it offered us a great opportunity for us to, you know, see some of our cast members that we hadn't seen for a while and kind of to fill a little bit of that that want for, you know, what the fans are looking for is they're trying to hear the news on whether or not the show's going to have a reunion or whatnot. It's mm-hmm. like, well, they just want to see some of these people back together and, um, you know, to get, get, you know, four or five of us sitting in a room chatting about the show. It was, um, you know, a, a, an experience that the fans really enjoyed. And, and they came back, you know, four or five times as we did a few of them, and it wound up just being, you know, um, the, the the most lucrative thing for us in our project. Yeah, raising that. Yeah, I mean, you leverage what you have. So, you know, if you've got a fan base, in, and I'm assuming, how did you get to that fan base? I mean, did you just hit the Facebook groups? I mean, I, I don't think you have an email list with a bunch of One Tree Hill fans. So, like, how mm-hmm. did you how did you reach out to these these communities and and get them to to watch and to contribute? Yeah, our, our followings on social media were a huge part of it. Um, uh, I mean, pretty much everybody that follows me is is a One Tree Hill fan, unless they're my mom or my friend. Um, so, <laughs> so you know, that was that was um, that was really important is being able to connect with people through social media. Um, that was what brought in, you know, our, I think our first wave of people. But I think another really important thing was that we were able to show. Um, these people that that ju- you know this first wave of people that we have a product um, that you're gonna like right because the challenge with an arts project is that you can't really show them the content of the arts project right you can't really like have virtual screenings for people of the movie you're trying to make um, fortunately we were making a TV show and we had shot a pilot and we were able to take this pilot around to some festivals um, uh, that were really really great like ATX festival is a television festival in Austin that um, showcases all kinds of television. Um, and, you know, they, they, they showcase a few independent pilots every year. They chose us for one of theirs. Um, Series Fest is an all independent television uh, festival that they hold in Denver, Colorado. Um, at the time, New York Television Festival was one. Um, so there was just, there was a bunch of different festivals that we were able to hit and we were able to invite fans out, you know, people that knew about us from One Tree Hill, invite them to these screenings um, talk to them after these screenings, meet them after these screenings and get their, first of all, creatively get their feedback, right? See if it, the show was actually funny to them. But then also they were able to see the first episode of the show and then, you know, tell other people on our Instagram feeds or on our Twitter feeds or, you know, on the message board on Indiegogo, like, yes, this is a good show. You will like this show. You know, there's, there's something here. Um, so, 
I think that that was a huge, huge asset to us being able to take out that sort of, you know, if, if this wasn't a TV show, you'd call it like a proof of concept, right? Mm-hmm, but it mm-hmm. was a TV show as a pilot. And it just, it just, um, the timing of that taking it out for those festivals, we, we, in hindsight, we realized just how incredibly, um, you know, valuable that was for us. And how many days did you shoot? Um, like how many total days? I mean, assuming you just sat and just just shot it all out in a, in a, in a row, right? So how many days did you shoot eight episodes? And, and did each episode's what, 30 minutes? Less than that? Approximately 30, yeah. We, we got um, we got anywhere from 25 to 37 minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, so thankful for the streaming services to be flexible on those <laughs> run times. Um, exactly. So we didn't have, a, have to kill as many babies as, as we might expected. Uh, but um, yeah, we wound up shooting over the course of about 35 days, uh, eight episodes. That's a lot. And yeah, obviously block shooting everything, getting locations wrapped up and was, was you know, key Michelle Lang, who um, that was seven worked... episodes, right? That we shot because we had already shot the pilot the year before, and then we shot seven episodes, the seven additional episodes over that thirty-five day period. The year Eight after, minus one is seven. That is confirmed. Right. <laughs> this is why we make a great team. Uh, so we, yeah, and uh, Michelle Lang, who um, works with the Nelms brothers, uh, um, she's married to Ian. There, they, she, you know, was so clutch in, in getting our schedule all dialed up and, and, and making sure that, you know, we're maximizing our locations. Um, and it was fluid too. That schedule was changing constantly. I mean, she did a good mm-hmm. job matching, mapping it out in the beginning. And we kind of had an idea of where we were going to be for those next 35 days, uh, from the jump, of course. But, um, you know, she was always kind of looking to adjust it. Where can we make, where can we save a buck? Um, and, you know, having somebody like that on, um, our team just, you know, thinking about things that we are not even anywhere on this in the same universe of thinking about um, with that scheduling and how we can save some money, especially when we're, we're doing our shoestring budget um, was key. So um, it was it was hectic, but we uh, we got it done. And, you know, Michelle Lang was a big part of that. So you guys uh, I mean, you guys have been on uh, you know, on sets pretty much all, almost all your life at this point. You were like really were on sets for a long time uh, and a couple and you've directed, a f- you know, a few episodes here and there. Uh, how much did that play in in the success of what you guys were doing? I mean, because obviously you knew what a professional quote unquote set was, but you knew that One Tree Hill set is definitely not going to be the, all the bells and whistles that you're going to be using on this show. So how was that transition? Because, mm-hmm. you know, you're used to being on I've been on network sets. They're they're nice. They're plush. The crafty. The crafty is fantastic. Lunch is you know, lobster, uh, you know, it's really, it's really a nice scenario depending on the budget of the show, but generally speaking, network shows uh, are really nice. So how was that transition from, Hey, I, I need something. Oh, we have a department for that too. We need something, figure it out. <laughs> mm. Yeah. I think it's, it's, it's a really good question because I think there are things that we, that we learned, you know, from being on larger sets that helped us and there were also things that totally blindsided us as well, right? Um, you know, there was, I think that the general concept of time management really sinks in when you uh, work in television, uh, you know, on whatever budget you were, you're working on, like, you know, working on uh, whatever, whatever network TV show, you're still trying to shoot an ungodly amount of pages a day. No matter what, there's not enough time. You're, you never have enough days to get the show, to get the episode that you want to shoot. And as an actor, you sit around and you just watch people like run around like their hair's on fire trying to make this impossible thing possible. So and you learn about time management really well because you're always watching your clock. Right. And so I think that's one thing that we were able to carry into to everyone is doing great is is clock management. Right. Is that time management is is making sure that, um, you know, we have contingency plans, that we have um, this space in our schedule to shoot things that we might have missed or that we're able to adapt. If, you know, we didn't get this one thing at this location, what other location can we put it at? We had seen enough of this um, sort of sleight of hand be played, you know, throughout our careers to be able to employ it ourselves. And obviously with the help of our pro- producing team. But then also there's nothing that can compare you to, you know, or that can prepare you to uh for the um you know first week of our shooting in steven's actual apartment and you know the fact that there's going to be 35 crew in a (laughs) two-bedroom apartment um you know wearing their work boots and i'm assuming did you get permit did you get permission 
or, or, or yep. you gorilla? Oh, you did get permission. You didn't gorilla. Yeah, yeah but you know, we, we <laughs> you stretched we got it. permission for a couple of people. <laughs> yeah, just for like two days. <laughs> Not necessarily. We won't say how many people were there, and we won't say for how many days. But it didn't really work out to that. What I had quoted. <laughs> I mean, and you know, you gotta like hand it to Stephen, who is, you know, this is his apartment. He's producing, writing the show. He's directing one of the episodes that we're shooting at that location. And he's got to be thinking about all these different things. And he's also thinking about the fact that like this person today didn't wear soft, sho- soft soled shoes. Yep. So like we might get kicked out. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> or he's worried about, you know, getting Starbucks gift cards to all of his neighbors and making sure that they got them so that we've got, you know, we're in the good graces of the building. Um, you know, it's not a it's not a completely conducive <laughs> mindset to uh, creativity. And nothing, you know, can really prepare you for that. Nothing in our experiences on. on I'm, I got PTSD right now. Seriously, you're like you're, start, you're starting to you're starting to. Tw- I can see the twitching. I can see the twitching I happening. Know, I don't know how we uh, I don't know how we got through those those days. Um, but yeah, I mean, I got sick in the middle of it as well. Oh, yeah. And, uh, anytime an Apple box was just scraping across the floor, I, I, I mentally murdered that individual and then carried on with my scene. I'll tell you what, man, like I've shot so much in my own places during my career, like at my own house, like my first, my first, like $50,000 I spent on my commercial demo reel back when I was doing commercials, which I shot on 35 and all that. I did it in my house. I had like two two full shoots in my house, like doing different areas. Like in my living room, I'd set up a, a set, and I like because I had to. And mm-hmm. that exact thing, someone like a grip would just drag something along, and you're just like trying to direct it. And then you have the money. So this is basically exact. The only thing that you did that I didn't do is I didn't act in it. Thank God. So I'm doing everything. I'm doing everything else. But I feel you, man. Like you, you that Apple box gets dragged. Oh God. Oh no. I know. We had it's <laughs> brutal. And I had this this deck that was was great because you know people can go have lunch out there and and we can store gear out there um and, but you know we fired up uh breakfast there at like 6 15 in the morning <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> oh my god how did we get away with it I like don't, starbucks I starbucks cards go a long way <laughs> they really yeah, did. yeah th- they thankfully really did. you know there was some supportive people some supportive neighbors but then there wasn't some supportive neighbors and there was, we did get a noise complaint like on the first day, you know, there was a, the manager who I'd spoke to hadn't talked to somebody else. And so they showed up and they were like, uh, what are you doing? <laughs> and I was like, you know, I talked to blah, blah, blah. They're like, Oh, okay. All right. Right on. Um, but at first they were, I thought, you know, they had come to basically shut us down. So yeah, man, it's, um, Coming I, for- it's still, yeah. I, once oh, the thank God that, that was, <laughs> Can well, you maybe see how much stress that, this after is five He's days, stressed out. He is stressing out. It's over, bro. After, bro, it's over. It's over. It's it felt, okay. It honestly felt like a mistake because <laughs> after all of this buildup to get to this point of wanting to shoot the show and it's our own and we're so excited and we got our uh-huh. first couple days of shooting and then all of a sudden it's just back-to-back days like in, in my apartment um, with one thing after another and I couldn't, you know w- – once we got to the finish line and, and we were like halfway through that last day there and I'm like, okay, we got it now. I know we're going to get through this location. The shoot started for me, but I couldn't mm-hmm. tell you what happened on any of the scenes in my character's apartment because um, <laughs> I, my brain was just ping ponging off the walls. And that's the thing. I mean, for, for filmmakers listening now, man, until you're in the, in, in, until you're in the weeds or as they used to say, like when you're in war, when you're in the shit, you really, really feel it because, man, it's a thousand things going on at the same time. You've got money dealing with. You've got your act. You, you were acting, which is insanity to me. Like I can't even begin to begin to try to think about acting in a scene while doing all this stuff. Uh, it's it's brutal, man. But I, I think this is a comment that no one's ever. This is a sentence that's ne- never been uttered in Hollywood. All I have is too much time and too much money to make this project. Like that. <laughs> that's never been uttered. In yeah, Hollywood, seriously. since the days of fucking Edison, <laughs> like, yeah. not, like no. no, no one has ever said that. Absolutely not. You know, it's it's insane. So you got another week? You sure you don't want to use it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm good. Do you want another month? I mean, we could just do another month if you want. Like, yeah. never. You've never. You never hear that. It's it's insane. <laughs> I mean, you I go get... to Panama and get that shot on the beach. <laughs> you don't want it. Okay. You don't want it. That's fine. We'll just green screen it. That's fine. Um, yeah, and I can imagine the culture shock for you guys as being 
you know, regular actors on a hit show and never having to think about any of that. Like even when you were directing on the show, you still never had to think about that. You were just directing a show and it's all your family and friends are around. You know, you've been with these people forever. You don't think about all that other stuff, really. I mean, you time management, yeah. But when everything's on your shoulders, I, I got to believe that the culture shock must have been. What, at what moment did that hit you guys? Like, was it day one when you said, on, the, on day one on the pilot even, like, did you just go, oh, we're not in Kansas anymore? Like when when was that? I mean, I'm sure someone told you. And it's like it's it's like having kids. Someone could tell you you're gonna have kids, but and, and oh, it's gonna be bad. You're gonna lose sleep until you have a kid. You have no idea. It's like right in your face. So it, when was that moment yeah. for you guys? I think for me it was when we were at Stephen's apartment, and um, <laughs> I don't know. This is probably the first time we've ever told this story. We might get crucified by our producers, but I just think it's too interesting. <laughs> um, you know, we had at, at when we started shooting. Um, we had about two thirds of our budget and we had a contingency plan in place. Like we were starting at Steven's apartment. We we're going to shoot all this contained stuff. We knew that we could shoot a version of our season for two thirds of the budget, right? We would just have to change a lot once we left Steven's apartment. Um, and, and we were still waiting to see if financier was going to come on to cover that, that final third. And we were getting to the point, I was probably like four or five days in when it was really like a breaking point. And Michelle Lang had to come to set and like sit me and Steven down and sit Ian Anesh down and Johnny Durango, our other executive producer. And, you know, the, like, the, we're, like the rest of the crew setting up a shot over at Steven's apartment. And we are like down the hall and sort of around the corner in like a little outdoor lounge. We could see across the, the gap to Steven's apartment. And it was nighttime. And Michelle's walking us through the fact that um, we might not get this money and that it could change a lot and but that everything's going to be OK. And I remember just having like a bit of like an out of body experience where I just sort of like I just sort of went numb and I just sort of left like I was just sort of seeing the world from behind my eyes. And I was like, oh, this is it. This is what they talk about. <laughs> this is, I'm dying. This is I'm dying. I'm dying. It I'm... all means too much. <laughs> and it's all on you. And um, yeah, something either really, really um miraculous is going to happen or or this is going to be a horror story you know what i mean it's like this wow. is the moment that it hinges on and thankfully something miraculous happened um in that particular scenario but that was a real yeah that was a real moment for me it was a, it was like a, it, you guys had a coming to jesus conversation like come to jesus conversations basically it sat you down oh, yeah. like it's like this guy's look it's this is and i've had by the way i've had those conversations with my first ad on projects or my upm on early 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 projects so like look man i know you've got 752 shots you want to do in four hours i understand that but this is the reality you got four shots let's do this <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. Yep. so you were gonna say steve uh i was just gonna say um you know yeah i think in, in i feel like you know james and i we've had this like you know go get them attitude. So it was like, there's nothing that we can't handle. Like we could, we could, we'll figure it out. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll figure out how we'll do this. Like, we're just not going to take no for an answer, blah, blah, blah. Like just learn on the fly. That's why I like working with James. Like he's resourceful. He gets it. He just shuts up and does the work, you know? And, you know, there was definitely times where like, Oh, you know what? We, we've, it's not that necessarily we've taken on too much. It's like, you just can't do this. Like this isn't, there are people that have gone to school for this or have trained to do this for a while. <laughs> and some of the tasks like we just took for granted, like, for example, locations, like I was doing locations for a while. And um, <laughs> then we got closer to shooting. And it was like, all right, there's still a lot of locations that need to be actually locked. And then it was like, well, those are kind of in the second half. So we'll start shooting. And now we're shooting and there's some locations in the back half that we're still trying to lock. And I'm trying to, and we're trying to negotiate like at every single location, it was not taking their, you know, their, their first offer, letting them know, like telling them the story, you know, we're, we're crowdfunded, we're shoo shoo shooting budget over here. So like, please like, you know, uh, what, what can you do to help us out? And it just, there was, you know, you're just juggling those. And, and we, we actually had in the middle of the shoot to bring somebody on and say, okay, this person's going to just handle locations, like stop worrying about it. See if you tried, you know, you yeah. got some good stuff, but like it's starting to, you know, it distract you from other things. So, yeah. um, you can't be driving from Northridge down to, uh, down to Downey every day. We're, we're, like <laughs> trying to, we're like putting the finishing touches on the script. It's just not, yeah. not 
And that's <laughs> and, and that's one of the biggest mistake first time filmmakers in the indie space do is they would like, oh, I can do all of this. Oh, I could do this. I could do yeah. that. And they take so much on that you get nothing done. You have yep. to bring you have to bring people and you have to have help in one way, shape or form. Um, and sometimes it's it's uh, educated help. Sometimes it's uneducated help. Like, you know, you get yeah. your bro- you yeah. get your brother, your buddy who wants to be in the business. Like, look, do location scouts. Sometimes it works out great. Sometimes not so much. <laughs> yeah. And you know, I think the, the line is blurred these days as well with, you know, what you can learn and what you can't execute. Right. Mm-hmm. Like you mm-hmm. can learn, a, you can learn a lot. Like, and this is, this has been a blessing for us. You know, the fact that technology has come so far, the fact that our access to information is just so exponentially better than it was even 10 years ago. Um, you know, but it also, it gives you this false sense of security. It gives you this, um, you know, false sense of capability, really, I think, um, you know, we, we did learn to do a lot. Um, and we did, we, we were, especially in post-production, right. Once we got into the editing process, um, we were able to save ourselves a lot of coin just by doing things ourselves and learning to do things by ourselves. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, um, we had to, we had to recognize where we had to draw the line where like, you know, okay, we can, we can keep banging our heads against the wall with this thing that we just learned to do on YouTube three days ago, or we can <laughs> sort of, you know, reach a point where we realize, oh, this is what they pay people big bucks for. Okay. Let's go find someone who knows what they're doing. Right. Before we, you know, you know, carve up our project uh, more than we need to here, or, you know, do something, you know, make some sort of fatal mistake right so you guys didn't uh shoot your own movie you you weren't the dps as well <laughs> we, did not, we did not soderbergh it no you didn't yeah. so, you didn't soderbergh. dude i found out i i honestly within like a couple years ago i found out that soderbergh was his own dp and he'd always been his own dp i had no idea because he changes his name on the credits yeah. i didn't know that yeah. i all of his and then you go back you know like he did oceans 11 and che and I mean, Aaron Brockovich wow. and all like he oh, he was the de- it's what well, you start thinking about it. And you're like, and he was the writer and he was like, he's a freak of nature. He's like an absolute wow. freak of nature to do all of that. Yeah. Like, very, very few, very few guys can do that. And trust yeah, me, I, yeah. my, my first feature, I was the DP on. And mind you, I was already 20 years in and I, and I, I've been a colorist for 10 years. So I'm like, you know what? Let me just get it down the line. If I just sit it down the middle expose it i'll fix it in post which is exactly what i did but after after that i was like never again never ever ever (laughs) again it's too much man it's too it's too much it's it takes a special brain to do all of that stuff um uh, good i was just gonna say another thing we learned like real quick was i think was important to take um being able to understand like a pulse of your set that i felt like I recognized um as i'm sitting around on a set waiting for you know to act on 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 certain just the you know how how quickly like a dynamic can change it's almost like people are and especially in these long days like people can get um you know they get edgy and naturally I, I totally understand it and so it doesn't take much to set people off and so to kind of you know uh be a little more aware of of you know the treatment of people especially and for us when you know there's no room to go anywhere we were crammed in an apartment or we're crammed in whatever location um you know all on top of each other that um you know to try to, you know, respect people for the jobs that they're doing, give the attaboys and, and, um, you know, also, I guess still try to provide some decent food because, you know, our crew, <laughs> like, they, uh, you know, we had them, there's no comfort for them whatsoever. Um, wow. and they're working completely full days. And, um, you know, I, I think M- Michelle Lang was, was key in saying, well, we're going to, we're going to pay for a decent caterer. You know, we got to get some, we got to get them fed well. Um, but, um, you know, just uh, trying to, I don't know, just check in with with crew and 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 have like, uh, you know, you create a, a cordial relationship with everybody. Um, and I think that also helps at the end of the day when, you know, the going gets tough and, and people either want to get the F out of there, which I understand, or just so sick of like this lack, like we're missing a couple of resources and you're having to wear an extra hat that you're not necessarily getting paid for. But like, you know what, they're going to step up because they believe in the people that are running this project. I, I think that that helped us a lot. And, and, you know, we also had young, um, we had a lot of young filmmakers, people that are just getting started in the business. And that was really crucial because while they're not getting paid, you know, big money, they're ready to hustle, you know, they're ready to, um, you know, to, to be on a set and, and make a film project, you know? So, um, that was, you know, something that was also very vital to, you know, 
fill in the blanks of not having a comfortable set that you would get on a major network. Yeah. Did you and guys? That's something that we learned. Oh, oh sorry. I was, oh. No, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, um, that's something that we learned from the Nellens brothers as well. Um, being on sets with the Nellens brothers, I learned very early on with them that like the reason that their sets are so amazing and people are so happy is because um, they realize that they're not being asked to do anything that the directors wouldn't do themselves or would, don't have the utmost respect yeah. for, right? Like these are guys that, these are not directors that go to the director's trailer in between setups and do whatever the hell they want to do in there. Like these are guys who are there on set every single every single moment they they love the process they truly love being there and that is contagious and that's what gets people through those long days and those long nights is is knowing that the person at the top still really cares about this and really cares about you know really wants everybody else to care um and is 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 willing to put in the work just like they are um i, I just yeah i mean we learned that from that from them very early on and just we try to be those guys on set every day now, did you guys uh, happen to feed your crew spinning wheels of death? Do you, do you know what those are? What is that? So, <laughs> no. This is an old. This is an old, this is the best stuff ever comes from uh, old DPs. Um, so a buddy of mine who's a, like he's been in the business 40, 50 years, and he was DPing something I was directing, and it was a low budget situation, and we talked about lunch, and I said, "Hey, do you guys, you know, maybe we should just get some pizza?" He's like, "Do not bring out spinning wheels of death." Do not bring out. He just he goes. That's what they're called because it just drags the crew, cheese and bread, and it just <laughs> slows everyone down. He goes, "Don't do it. Don't do it." And he also and he also always used to say every time he couldn't get something the way he wanted to, he's like, "I'm surrounded by assassins, surrounded by assassins <laughs> everywhere I look. Surrounded by assassins." And I use that line constantly on a set, like surrounded by assassins. God damn it! But did you did did, did you do the pizza thing at one point? We actually didn't do pizza. Good. We, uh, you see, I that's a good not. producer. Yes. Good producer. Shout out. Was it Spartan Catering, James? Spartan Brothers. Yeah. Spartan, but yeah, they were they were solid. They they had, they had good food and and um, you know, we tried to make really sure yeah, food. you know, had the other options for um, you know, people with with allergies or whatever, and and just made sure we we're on top of that. Or or you know, there was a couple days where they might have forgotten, or maybe those first days, you know, working through the kinks that. There weren't enough of those meals. It was like, let's go, you know, let's get this fixed right now, you know. Um, and other than that, we kept them well caffeinated. That's for sure. Um, <laughs> this, this this started well, I, you know, myself, but our DP was was a caffeine fiend, and so um, we just made sure we, we we got the Starbucks runs and the coffee going. And you know, thankfully, it was a small enough crew that were like, all right. And this is something that James and I would just handle. We're like, you know what, just take our card and go. Um, let's get everyone, whoever wants something from just, Starbucks or just whatever. Go, just go. It, yeah. It's the cheapest yeah. It's the cheapest investment you can make in this film. I'll, I'll, sure. I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. I come from Miami originally. So in Miami, um, on sets, there's a little old Cuban man who's he's, – he's hired. It's always a little old Cuban man who walks around about two to three times a day with a tray full of these little thimbles of coffee called cotaditos, which is Cuban That's coffee. Smart little they're like this big and you look like that can't do anything and i always used to love i'm cuban so I, I i was raised with this stuff so i i see you know people who are not used to cuban coffee like oh there's just a few of them that's that's just so little and they would chug like four or five of them at once <laughs> and within 15 minutes they're just like just like freaking they're just freaking out and i'm like we, we, and all the all the people who are used to that coffee, like, look, let's, let, let's watch. Let's see what happens to that act, that actor. And you just see him just start freaking out, like trying that's to do a funny. scene. So Cuban coffee, if you can ever do I had to manage that earlier. I love that. That's, that sounds efficient. <laughs> yeah. And there's like, he, and there's a little way he does it with the sugar and he like, he, 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 he makes it all foam up. It's, it's a, it's an artistry oh. thing. And it just, they're little, little thimbles, man. Not even shot clot, like thimbles. That's how powerful and dense the Cuban coffee is what he makes. It yeah, awesome. the, the, the car, the Starbucks runs and it is, I think Starbucks, you know, there's are sure people that will shit on the coffee naturally because it's not that great, but there's still a lot of people that are like, Oh my God, it's a, it's a dessert couple, to them. Right. A couple people. So yeah. <laughs> you get that coffee run dialed up for right after lunch. And, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's a little gift. That gift goes a long way. Mm -hmm. um, those, those, anytime that the crew was feeling down, it was like, all right, let's on the double with, with the, um, the Starbucks runs and, and then when someone would show up with them, you know, everyone perked up and it, it was, it was, and, uh, I don't... it was as much for us as it was for anybody else too. <laughs> I mean, we needed it. You gotta keep, yeah, you gotta keep, you gotta keep the, the ball rolling. I mean, look, if you don't have money to pay them their normal day rates 
at minimum, feed them well and get them coffee. Yes. Feed them well and get them coffee. That's, I mean, you could, you could pay them nothing. Feed them well. Yes. And and that's at minimum you have to do. And and that's going to be the best investment you can have in your projects uh, without question. (laughs) Sorry. So you finally get this whole thing together, guys. It's, it's finished. It's done. You guys are feeling good about it. And you're like, okay, now what? (laughs) How the hell do you go out? How do you get Hulu's interest in it? And like, you know, I'm sure you hit walls everywhere you went because like this has never happened. No one's ever done this. How did you do it? Yeah, it was a series of unfortunate events followed by one very fortunate event. Um, <laughs> one single very fortunate event. Um, well, let's see. We uh, we finished. We, it took us about eight months to finish the show um, in post to you know get all the episodes to where they needed to be. Um, as we were doing that, we also. Um, we, we got, see, uh, sorry, we got episode two across the finish line and then we took episode two out to some of these festivals that had accepted us and, um, you know, our pilot episode. Um, we also use episodes one and two to shop really, uh, to take out in a sort of soft way, right? Like to take out to some contacts, mm-hmm. um, or some, you know, inroads that we had made. Um, so we continued that festival circuit. We continued to, um, take it out a bit, but again, it was the same thing as with um, that pilot episode. We still didn't have a sales agent. We were still going through our talent agents to reach development executives. We were still running into walls, and we couldn't get anybody to tell us what to do. Um, you know, we, we <laughs> there was no <clears throat> that whole side of the industry is so relationship based, um, mm-hmm. and we didn't have the person with the insight or the or the relationships. Or if we could talk to somebody that did have the relationships. We had something that they didn't know what to do with because there was no template for it. They're like, right. if you brought me a movie, if this was a movie, it would be one thing. There's a million ways you could go. But this is a TV show, and we don't know what to do with this right now. Um, and um, so we got to – I guess we, we finished the show sometime in um, – what it, was it, mid, mid-2019, mid Stephen, something like that? Or maybe fall of 2019, we started really um, getting to a place where we were happy with the show and felt like it was finished. Yeah. Yep. Fall. Yeah. Um, and we're still taking it out. Uh, we finally realized that this whole sales thing is probably not going to happen for us. So we start um, getting ready to self-distribute. Uh, we were going to go through Amazon. Uh, we were getting our music finished. Uh, we were getting all our contracts in line. Uh, we were about two weeks away from hitting from hitting um, submit to Amazon's platform. To, for, but uh, so, so so for basically for SVOD and TVOD or just TVOD? Yeah, for for rentals first, I think. Yeah, yeah, to, for, to, for, to rent it or buy it. Trans- yeah. yeah, transactionals first. So, but you yeah. knew that. I mean, your budget was. I mean, based on the numbers you're saying, your budget was well north of 250. So mm-hmm. to generate that in transactional takes an obscene amount of work. And yeah. luck and magic from the film gods to make that work. So and we were planning yeah. on going. We were taking it as we're gonna take the show on the road. Like, there, we're gonna, all right, we're gonna do that. Now we also got to go to what was successful for us and go fill some theaters. You know, like yeah. tour around, make some stops, and do some appearance kind of stuff just to leverage up as much interest right. and, and bring in and some income on that a- to try to get back our budget. Yeah, we came up with a pretty good game plan for that. You know, um, we did the numbers and it seemed like we could get somewhere close based on, you know, we've done uh, fan conventions before for One Tree Hill. Uh, We knew that there was a certain amount of a built in audience for everyone is doing great itself anyways. Um, You know, we felt good about our our odds, really. Um, We knew that it would be really, really tough. Um, We knew that it would be basically like crowdfunding all over again. Uh, Fun, fun. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but we just wanted to get the show out there and we didn't know any other way to do it. Um, and so, yeah, that took us to, uh, I think, about January or February of 2020. And then um, my brother, uh, who was a producer on the show as well, uh, his name is Stuart. He just made a random phone call to a friend of his who is a producer who um, has a relationship with Endeavor content. And mm-hmm. um so my brother sent this producer our show, our first couple episodes. The producer was like, well, this is interesting. I don't know. Um, by the time he sent it to Endeavor, this agent in Endeavor had taken a look and we were going into lockdown. We were, uh, we, the lockdown wasn't far away. And this agent went, OK, well, this is, you know, interesting. Like he, he really, to his credit, like he really saw him, himself in, it in, in these weird ways. When we finally got on the phone to talk to him, he sort of pitched our show back to us in a way that nobody else really had, which was really cool. 
uh, he seemed to just connect with it on, on, on one level. But then on another level, he was like, you know, we don't know when people are going to be making stuff again. Um, there's going to be a real hole in, um, you know, in, right. in buyer schedules, you know, come, you know, quarter three, quarter four. And, um, and, and this could be a possibility. So um, Endeavor Content took it on. And then uh, there was a list of about 17 different buyers that they were going to go out to with the show. And um, <laughs> over the course of what, three or four months, each of those buyers passed really, really painfully. And slowly and, uh, and slowly. <laughs> and slowly and slowly and painfully. And yeah, we were, we were worn down to the point where we were pretty much just like, um, you know, going to the park and laying down and staring at the sky, waiting to die. Right. Um, because there was no tour anymore. The tour was shut down. There's no tour. Yeah, the there's tour none of that stuff. Down. Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh and, man. Uh, and then we got the, yeah, we got the call from Endeavor that said, um, yeah, Hulu wants to, to make an offer. And that, uh, that, that changed, that changed literally everything. Wow. So it was a sim it was literally the timing, right place, right time, right product. Yeah. A, a year earlier, yeah. maybe not so much a year later, yeah. maybe not so much, but that moment exactly. in time, was the time and it's similar to my film like at that moment in time it worked like they would never buy a film like that today um so it just happened to be the right timing man that's you know what like like i, I always say to people look luck has a bit to do with this whole thing that we do it, there is luck but the thing is if you hadn't have built that product all the luck and world really wouldn't have helped you <laughs> you needed something yeah. to sell so it just happened I, to I work out it's kind of like it's a create your own luck scenario, you know, and mm -hmm. there's no, you know, everyone's looking for like the recipe, right? How do you do it? So how did you get your independent show to Hulu, right? Tell us the secret. And but ultimately, there was a lot of hard work that then fell on chance, you know, and fell on a right place, right time opportunity, which you do hear all the time. And I think that the way you get there at the end of the day is, you know, you pay your dues, you work hard, you, you get, you know, you're, you're trying to, you're, you're bringing people in too, you're bringing smart people around you, keep you motivated, keep you pushing where, you're, you know, you're overextending yourself. And I think that's what invites the, the, the opportunity for, for maybe that luck to strike, you know, and it's no guarantee, but this is also what we sign up for. Um, but, you know, um, had we tried to do these buyer screenings that didn't work well had we tried to shake down our reps for months slash years to you know get it to the right people and never feel like we got the right shot um you know had we not done all of that um would we have gone to this gotten to this moment of um right place right time you know i don't think so it just you know there was no shortcuts um so you know you can you yeah. can help your fate i think <laughs> i like okay. to, i like to believe yeah. you know i, yeah. I believe <laughs> no, there's there's no there's no question about it, man. There's absolutely no yeah. question. So when is this? Uh, so you basically sold Hulu for domestic only. So this still has an international opportunity as well for sales. We're going to be uh, in Australia, in the Nordics, and in Latin America, courtesy of uh, Paramount Plus and their rollout overseas, <laughs> which is which is really really incredible. And another one of those another one of those things. It's like you know. Oh, man, it's just uh, it's just it's crazy because, you know, we didn't get Hulu. Then our show is never legitimized enough to get on, you know, Paramount Plus oh. for overseas. You know what I mean? It's like this domino effect of, of, of things of things happening. Um, and, you know, obviously it shows the power of getting on to, um, you know, a streamer like that. But um, we're just really grateful that we're going to get a reaction from other cultures as well, because, you know, um, we seem to have gotten a really good feedback from our domestic audience. Mm -hmm. uh, people are still finding the show. Most people seem to like it. Um, uh, but, you know, comedy is hard <laughs> when you take it, when you export it. Mm -hmm. Different cultures find different things funny. Um, we were actually really inspired by um, some Australian comedy uh, and Australian story storytelling in general, British storytelling. So we feel like it will export nicely there, we hope. Um, but we you know non-English speaking countries, it's really impossible for us to tell. And so, yeah, we're kind of waiting on pins and needles to see how it does. And it's, it's going to be really exciting. We got a call from Endeavor actually asking if we wanted to um, if we wanted to have a say in um, the voices for um, the Latin American market and the Portuguese market for, for <laughs> dubbing. And we both were like, I think we could be hands off with this. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah. this is one we're, we're comfortable delegating. <laughs> Just like, estoy aquí, por favor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, I, I, I got to brush up on my Portuguese before I, you know, 
<laughs> no, dude, I used to do tra I used to do um translation, not translations, but versioning out for uh commercials for Latin America. I had to do 30 different versions because every country has their own Spanish. So you you can't you can't, you can't send you can't send a Puerto Rican VO guy to Mexico. You can't send a Mexican guy to Argentina. There's such a different in accents. And that's when I discovered that you just can't it's not one Spanish. You can't send a Spaniard down to Mexico. Like it doesn't it doesn't translate well. It doesn't get accepted well. So that 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 that's going to be a process for you guys down there. Whoever's doing that, which you guys hands off of that, it's going to be an interesting <laughs> you're making me very glad that we said we'll no stay of stay away stay, <laughs> stay away out from, of it. stay out of that dude just collect the check sir just take the check and cash it <laughs> um that's great man listen it's and this is an inspiring story I, mean, I i know that there's a lot of um actors out there who uh you know have maybe been on shows or has a following and are frustrated just like you guys were with you know having to go and hustle out jobs and, and asking for permission constantly and i'm not saying you're still not doing that obviously because i'm not the agents would get very upset so um <laughs> so you're still going out on jobs and stuff but at least you have a little bit more a little bit more control of your own destiny where you're like you know we have a track record now now we can go out and do a, a, maybe a movie or or another series and maybe ha get hired to do be on that side of the fence and now you're building a different level of your career um you know what what advice would you give any actors listening out there right now because i know I'm, i have a few actors who listen as well um about trying to do something similar to what you guys are doing yeah i think um i think I, you know one thing that was easy to forget the more serious the process got for us was that we started this thing as an experiment um a creative experiment and we agreed with each other that you know if that pilot episode sucked um then nobody would ever see it and that would be okay. You know, we, we only spent as much money as we were comfortable losing on that pilot. Um, and we went at it experimentally. And I think that gave us the freedom to be creative as creative as we could possibly be to be uninhibited and, you know, and being creative. And it really helped us to just enjoy the process. Um, and that was that was extremely important in finding the tone of this thing and, and, and determining what it really was, um, you know, in shooting it and also, you know, in getting in there in the edit and um, making sure that we just had the time and we were giving ourselves we were giving ourselves the luxury of time to learn and, and taking the pressure off. Right. As much as humanly possible, um, at least with that that first episode. And I would say for, you know, that's the advice that I would give to an actor that's going to go out and make their their first movie is like, look, you won't get this right the very first time. It, 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 you might get it right, but you won't get it as right as you could because you will be learning every step of the way. And that's OK. That doesn't actually mean that it won't be brilliant. Like it could be incredible, but you're going to see the mistakes in it. You know, the finished product, you will see the mistakes in it. So don't worry about getting it exactly right all the way through. Worry about um, setting out to tell the story that you want to tell and and by the end of it, you know, hopefully you will, you will have told it. I think, you know, know the story that you want to tell and also um, make the kind of thing that you would want to watch. And, mm -hmm. and that's all you got to worry. That's all you got to worry about the first time around, you know, surround yourself with people that can worry about the other stuff for you and treat them with respect and pay them well if you can. Um, but at the end, at the end of the day, just, just try to make, just try to make the show or the movie that you would want to watch and, um, and see what happens. And, you know, if you make mistakes, that's okay. You will learn from those mistakes, mm -hmm. and you'll get you'll you'll get it right the next time. How about you, Stephen? Yeah, I would I would say um, you know check your ego at the door uh, from the jump. You know, <laughs> it's it's not um, you're not the star of the show here. I think anybody who can come on and work for hopefully a decent meal and that Starbucks coffee after lunch is now the star for you. You know, it's it's I think. Um, getting those people around you that, that are going to be able to, um, you know, help push you with this project, help get it to its finish line and have it, you know, be quality in a way. Um, you know, I, I think that, um, creating those relationships and, um, supporting them where, wherever they need support is, is very vital. So, you know, this isn't about just work on your project here. You know, you offer your ass up to carry gear for them on another project or whatever it is, you know, um, I do that and, and get that experience and, and create those relationships because 
this is not something we're not Steven Soderbergh over here. Um, you're not going to be able to do everything on your own. Um, you need a lot of help. And, and so, you know, people are going to work with people that they you know believe in and that they enjoy working with, especially when the going gets tough, you know? Um, so, um, yeah. And yeah. have a really good script supervisor. If you're going <laughs> to be in front of, in front of and behind the camera, get yes. your ass a really good script supervisor. A good, a good, a good first AD doesn't hurt either. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Definitely doesn't hurt either. <laughs> I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Uh, I ask all my guests, um, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? True. Get off your butt and do it. That was, that was the one that took me the longest to learn. Definitely. Really? Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, coming from, look, a, as an actor, you um, are very single minded when you get to set You're, and that's the way it should be. Like you are there to take care of your job um, and, um, and, and, and be present for the other people that are in the scene with you. Um, uh, you know, and I worked in, I worked as a director in television as well, which was incredible, which was one of the most like animating and eye opening things that ever happened to me because that's where I realized just how much of an ecosystem <laughs> every single set is. Right. Um, and how much uh, every little component depends on the next one. Um, that was a big eye opener for me. And it was a whole level, a whole other level of working hard. And, and, and it was something that I enjoyed. But still, you have that safety net. Still, there is a machine working to help you get everything done. You are not pulling the thing along. You are more right. of a uh, facilitator, right? Um, but yeah, it wasn't until, you know, working with the Nelms brothers and Michelle Lang and Johnny Durango on their sets that's when I realized the power um, and the gratification that can come from just getting off your butt and doing something, um, you know, yourself, pulling something yourself together yourself, how much you can learn, how good um, you can get at what you want to do. Uh, you know, if you want to tell stories, the best way to, um, if you want to tell stories this way, I think the best way to become a master at it is to, is to um, you know, try to pull something together yourself. That's what they, they taught me. Mm -hmm. And it took me a while. It took me a while to learn that. I didn't meet them <laughs> until I was like 25. So, <laughs> how about you, Steve? Oh man, um, there's, there's a few things I figure out. I'm still getting. Uh, <laughs> I'm still, but I, I, I think, um, man, I. It, it's funny. Like, I do believe that <laughs> it's tricky. That like once like staying in your own lane is is an important thing to to know like what you can't do but at the same time with this spirit of this project it was like try to do as and figure out as much as possible but um i think that there was i, I still need to understand like knowing my my boundaries and and once i know what when i know what those are like just don't try to pretend like you know anything else you know or no further trying to um you know, take on something that you're like, oh, well, I'll just figure it out. Um, you know, I think it's okay to, to seek out help or admit that you just don't know how to do something. You know, I think sometimes we're, we're fearful of, of, you know, feeling um, inept at, at whatever, you know, at, at being able to, to finish a job. And so, you know, you, you try to overextend yourself or, or you try to say you got it, but, um, you know, and ultimately you don't. And now you've set things back. So I think it's, it's understanding, you know, my boundaries. And <laughs> I feel like I'm still, I'm still trying to figure that out. You know, like, you know, I, I can't say that I can do this when, when I can't, or, you know, I'm, there's not everything I can figure out on my own. Right. Um, so, you know. and, and, uh, the toughest question of all three of your favorite films of all time. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> well, Alex, I listened to your podcast and prepared myself for this because I never had the answers for this. You but son I of a go bitch! With, Thanks for the heads gotta, up, dude. I gotta, yeah, no, yeah, I planned. I planned it this way. I got to go with uh, ET. Um, <laughs> okay. Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Nice, and, nice. Um, and Silver Linings Playbook. Nice. Because I, 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 I feel sense. like I learned something from each one of those films at the time in my life that I watched it. So it was like you know when I was a tadpole and then when I was like, you know, <laughs> pubescent and then as an adult. So right. there was something for me in each one of those stages. So, so oh, you God beat that. Steven. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, he just left you dangling in the wind there, brother. I'm sorry about that. Well, <laughs> I'm just going to say my, we had, we had like three VHS tapes in my house growing up. Um, and one was like somebody, 
had left a, a, a blockbuster video, um, which was Predator, uh, over at our house. <laughs> Obviously one of the greatest uh, action films of all time. Um, and Forrest Gump, which I thought like the scope of that movie was always something that just like stuck in my mind. Um, and the way, yeah, I, the, the way the story's told, the way we go throughout all these different parts of history. And, mm-hmm. and um, that sat with me. I think um, of late, um, well, obviously not of late, but uh, it was actually James' little brother introduced me to True Romance, uh, oh, Tarantino, directed yeah. by Tony Scott, and so that good. is a uh, that is a favorite of mine. Dude, I remember walking out because I'm a bit older than you guys, so I remember walking out of the theater watching True Romance, and me and my friends just looked at each other like, "What the hell <laughs> was that?" Like we were just so- in shock. <laughs> That's another movie that another feeling that I had there. I'll give you two other movies that for me going to the movies with like the experience is about um, paranormal activity. Mm-hmm. When that movie ended, <laughs> like just the reaction in the theater was amazing. Mm-hmm. And then also uh, Interstellar was another one which was amazing going into the bathroom afterwards and just getting everyone's reaction. And just like, Oh wow. Like that was like, it's like when, when it's kind of almost hard to step back in society, you know, you're like, <laughs> fuck out. Like, and it's not just the glare of being back in the sunlight. It's like, Whoa, like where did I just go? God, I missed that. I <laughs> yeah. missed doing, I miss yeah. going to the theaters, man. I miss going and, and, and getting yep. that experience. I just saw a picture of Nolan in Burbank. Oh uh, yeah. I in, saw that. Going, going to, that's the theater I go to. That's exactly that's the exact theater I go to. He's just sitting there with his wife and his friend, just like, "We're gonna watch." I I think he was watching the Schneider cut there. I'm not sure what he was watching, but he was watching something there. Um, That's what I was. I was honestly trying to Google that as well. I I think he was. I think I think he was (laughs) watching Justice League. I think it was Justice League, the four hour cut of that at at the theater. It's yeah, man. Nolan is. I mean, Jesus. There's only one of him running around right now in the world. That's for sure. Listen, guys. Thank you so much for uh, for being on the show and being uh, an inspiration to a lot of people out there. Hopefully, listening and and maybe they'll pick up their uh, their uh, their 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 chariot to uh, to take it to the finish line um, and try to get something done. So I appreciate that, man. And good luck to you guys. Uh, keep going. I can't wait to see what else you guys do next. Thanks so much, man. Yeah, I appreciate it. appreciate your podcast too. Great work. Thank you, man. Thank you, yeah. guys. Thank you, man. Keep hustling.